It's like the year 2000 and 2008, says a former Goldman Sachs fund manager. Fears the U.S. economy is heading for a crash landing. Private equity bubbles the catalyst as valuations are marked to fantasy. Welcome to ICU Your Trade. I'm your host, Pamela Ambler. Soon we'll be joined by our special guest, Nick Ferris, Chief Investment Officer at Vantage Point. Then later, our resident expert, economist Alex Holmes from Oxford Economics, a look at the impact of a U.S. recession on the rest of the world. First, though, yield curves have never been this inverted and not signaled a recession. Bank lending standards have never been this tight without signaling a downturn. And leading indicators have never been this negative without signaling an economic slowdown. I see your trade is brought to you by IC Markets, a leading high performance trading provider. Trade up to IC Markets. Let's dive right in. And for anyone listening that can't see the charts, we'll talk you through the data. So, Nick, let's look at the relationship between unlisted real estate funds versus REITs. Uh, what is this chart showing us about what's happening right now compared to 2000 and 2008? I think importantly, just to start with, that, that there are some significant differences between today and 2008 or the, or the current episode. This episode is not really a credit episode like 2008. In our humble opinion, it's more of a, an asset overvaluation episode. And, and this is a great example of that, where it's a, that there's a mark to market problem in, in especially unlisted assets, commercial real estate, private equity, venture capital. And, and this chart's a good example of that, where you've got an unlisted fund, which is basically not marked to market the valuation of their assets compared to the underlying listed securities, which you can see are down 40 to 50%. So the answer is probably somewhere in between, but this particular fund has actually been gated. Um, they've had redemption outflows, or sorry, they've had redemptions, but they've actually gated their funds. So they, they're trying to prevent not selling the assets and, and therefore realizing the losses. Right. And of course, we've seen the collapse of a number of banks this year, Silicon Valley Bank, and then of course, Credit Suisse and now First Republic. Are we seeing a repeat of the banking crisis that we saw back in 2008? Again, yes and no. The, the, the problem with uh, SVB in particular was, uh, again, it was a mark to market problem. It, it, wasn't, um, it wasn't a loan collateral problem or, or, a, or a loan loss problem. Um, and so, so again, that's a very, very important difference. Um, but when they started to face deposit outflows and they were forced to mark to market their, their underlying assets or take losses, that accelerated the outflows and they, and they were shut down. And then that's been exacerbated, or it's exacerbated or amplified the problem with the other regional banks in the US as well. So there was, of course, the loss of confidence, uh, but what's your view on what's causing banks to fail, the other ones to fail in 2023? Well, uh, ironically or perversely by effectively saying that that um, deposits at JP Morgan and in the other major banks are very, very safe, effectively guaranteed. They don't say that, but effectively guaranteed. It means that investors or depositors that have their deposits at the regional banks are more likely to shift them to the major bank, to, to JP Morgan. Uh, would you be able to describe the factors that led to the current, what you describe the valuation situation that we're in? What is this a uh, chart of commercial mortgage-backed securities shows us, show us. Again, it's, it's, it's a similar problem. So the, the commercial mortgage-backed securities effectively loans to real estate and then package that up into, into a debt security. And this is just an ETF that reflects that. And you can see that the value of that ETF has, has gone down considerably in the last, the, last 12, well, the last 12 months. Also, you can see the relationship or that that actually led the, the, the problem in uh, the regional bank index, which is on the same chart there. And um, the, the relationship there is that uh, regional banks in the US provide 70 to 80% of the finance for commercial real estate. So again, there's the, re the relationship with commercial real estate. And for smaller banks, uh, are they too exposed to assets that weren't marked to market accurately? Yes, absolutely. I think that, that commercial real estate is a great example of that, um, especially the office space where there's been distress. Um, where um, you know, work from home has become uh, a, a greater factor and, 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 and vacancy rates are much, much larger in as major cities like San Francisco, for example. And, and so you've seen this um, uh, you know, significant pressure on the potential valuation of, of office in particular. 
but that's not necessarily reflected in the private asset portfolios. Um, going back to your question about you know the cause of it, um, from from our perch, almost a decade of, of near zero interest rates and super abundant liquidity, um, it contributed to the, the, to the to the flow into those sectors or the demand for those assets, and and, and therefore uh, therefore the misvaluation, and a lot of large pension funds and insurance companies have. 10 to 15 percent of their assets in um, unlisted securities or, or unlisted assets like commercial real estate um, partly because there's this sort of misperception that that those assets have lower volatility returns um, but volatility is not a very good measure of risk um, the the risk on an asset is really the the, the price you pay for it in the, in the future return um, and if the underlying fundamentals deteriorate and the value of that asset has to get marked down, um, then you've got a significant problem because many of these assets are actually very, very illiquid. And so you sort of answered this, so the question on why this situation arose, but so now let's go to the next chart, which perhaps shows why you are concerned about the US economy coming in for a hard landing. Can you talk us through what you see based on the senior loan officer survey? Yeah, so the Senior Loan Officer Survey is, is, is an excellent leading indicator. It, it, essentially what it's saying is it, it's a question or a survey of loan officers at banks. And they ask the question, are you tightening or loosening lending standards? And over 40% of senior loan officers are tightening lending standards uh, to large firms in the US. And it's a similar number for small firms. In fact, I think it's a little bit higher. And you can see the, the relationship that has with the credit risk premium or the credit spread on the US high yield market. And the, there's a significant divergence there. You know, when, the, when the lending standards have been this tight historically, it's typically led to a recession uh, because it's tightening credit, tightening the availability of credit. Um, and you can see that the credit spread itself is actually still quite low relative to where the tightening and lending standards would imply. Um, the other important point about this chart is that that data was released before the banking crisis started. So we suspect that lending standards have tightened even more um, since the, the crisis in regional banks. So you've described sort of this tightening credit and lending standards um, uh, situation that we're currently in. What does that mean for unlisted companies? I think it, it amplifies the, 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 the constraint on the ability to get credit, uh, which is the lifeblood of you know, lots of companies. So I think it will exacerbate the problem. Um, and those companies previously, especially in sort of um, private equity in BC, again, during the super abundant liquidity period or, or regime, were able to get capital very, very easily. That's become much more challenging today. And if the economy comes in for a crash landing, can you see a scenario in which the Fed starts cutting interest rates? Yes, they will have to. Absolutely, but 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 the challenge will be if core if core inflation remains elevated, it, it will constrain their ability to, in terms of how much they can actually cut, especially relative to market expectations. But it also probably depends on the feedback loop and how badly the the fallout is in terms of the the equity market and credit market. Got to read your tea leaves. <laughs> um, and another if scenario: if the U.S. economy crash lands, how do you think? Jay Powell will weigh up the risk of inflation against the falling economy? It's a great question. Again, I think the, it, it depends on how quickly in, inflation can, can come down. It's, it's, a, it's a key difference from, say, the episode in 2018 when, when the Fed pivoted very, very quickly. They were able to pivot because inflation was 1.9%. Uh, as we just mentioned, inflation's running at between 4.6 and 6.1, depending on the core measure you use. Um, so there's a lot of work to do still, I think, in, in terms of waiting for inflation to come down. And a question about how long you expect, if we go into a recession, how long that could possibly last? I guess a typical recession probably lasts um, nine to 12 months uh, in terms of duration, but it's probably the depth or the magnitude that I. I'm more concerned about. Um, so far, it, from an equity market perspective last year, most of the correction which we saw um, was really a, a valuation derating. Um, 
So the good news is that valuation is no longer expensive. The bad news is it's not yet cheap. The other problem is that what we haven't seen so far is the significant decline in earnings or corporate profits. And, and our fear is that still lies ahead. In a typical recession, corporate profits decline by 15 to 25%. Um, and so that's the sort of order of magnitude of, of downside risk there is uh, in corporate profits. Before we dive deeper, Alex Holmes from Oxford Economics joins us to take a look at the economic probability of a recession in the U.S. and what that means for the rest of the world. Alex, what would you say your view is on whether or not the U.S. is going to move into a recession? Thanks, Pablo. Yes, as Nick said, a lot of indicators are pointing to a, the chance of a recession in the U.S. at the moment. Behind me is the New York Fed's model of uh, the probability of a recession is currently pointing to a 60% chance of recession. That's the highest it's been in decades. Of course, indicators uh, are not always right. They can send false signals. Um, but what's remarkable about the moment is just how universal forward indicators are in pointing to a recession and how strongly they are pointing to it. Um, whether you take the New York Fed model, the Cleveland Fed's model, the Conference Board Economic Index, they're all flashing bright red. What about other indicators like the yield curve, one that markets seem to be so obsessed over? Yeah, as you mentioned, the yield curve is probably the most watched indicator out there. Just to explain, the yield curve um, denotes the relationship between the cost of borrowing money and the period over which you borrow it. So it's usually upward sloping, which means that it costs more to borrow money over a longer period of time to reflect the inherent uncertainty as you get further out into the future. But sometimes yield curves invert, that means the short-term rates rise to be higher than long-term rates. And inversions often foretell this trouble afoot. And if you look at the yield curve at the moment, it's, it's the most inverted it's been for, for, for decades again. And what about uh, when America sneezes, the world catches a cold? Uh, is there going to be a ripple effect uh, to the rest of the world if the US goes into a recession? The first thing to say is that not all recessions are made equally. So it's important to think about the drivers of the recession when you're examining what the impacts might be. So in 2008, it was a credit crunch and a global financial crisis, which rippled out throughout the rest of the world. This time around, it's more being likely to be driven by the Fed's battle with inflation. Um, that means that perhaps there's not gonna be the same kind of contagion, financial contagion to the rest of the world. It's more likely to be just um, a simple external demand shock. The US is a massive market for, for goods, uh, and that means that there's a downturn in the US, goods demand for the kind of ex exports that people produce is, is gonna fall. Alex, thank you, as always. So Nick, back to you. How does Asia fare in your view? Does your mark to fantasy scenario apply here in Asia as well? Yes and no. The good news in Asia is that the bear market started in February 21. So it's been going for a lot longer. And the drawdown in Asian equities and emerging market equities more broadly was much deeper than it was in the US and, and, and elsewhere. So the drawdown in Asia Pacific was about 40% from the peak in 21 to the trough in October last year. And valuation is, is much cheaper or at a much greater discount than it is in other parts of the world, especially the US. So, so that's the good news. Also on the credit side, there was a much bigger episode um, from, from a credit perspective. And Asian high yield spreads are actually around, still close to a thousand basis points. So they're still close to distress levels. So a lot more risk is priced into risky assets in this part of the world. So that, that, that's the good news. Uh, on, the, on the negative side, that, that same sort of mark to market problem does exist in, in some of the markets. We are seeing it play out in, in, in some of the riskier markets, like Chinese real estate, for example. Um, but, but there is still some risk that, that, that there is further to fall. Can you elaborate a little bit more um, in terms of your reviews on whether unlisted assets are accurately priced in Asia and in China? Yeah, th that's a much more challenging question because it, but it, because it is much more opaque. It's, it's a more opaque market, e even more so than the US. At least there, there, there's some um, rigor in terms of valuation uh, of, of uh, audited valuation in the US. So, so it's a much more challenging question. I think probably we, you know one of the areas where we where we're a little bit concerned about is uh, is the distress in in markets like Vietnam where. 
where there's, um, where there's again, there's been another credit boom bust episode and, and, a, and, a, and a regulatory crackdown. So it, it, the good news is though, that there's also opportunity in that um, for, for investors that can take advantage. So, th so there is likely to be some distressed assets that, that, um, that, that create an opportunity. Right, and can the world rely on Asia and China to lead the world out of recession? The short answer is no. That uh, China, the recovery in China from the from the reopening has actually been fairly disappointing so far, at least from an external demand perspective. Um, there's been pockets where it's where it's worked, and a, a, as a fund, we've we've taken advantage of that by um, buying some of the big platform companies in in China, uh, Alibaba, Tencent, Baidu, and JD.com. We also bought the Australian iron ore producers. Uh, which benefited from the rally in iron ore prices in anticipation of uh, industrial demand. Um, but overall, it's been fairly disappointing uh, in terms of the follow through impact. I mean, to be fair, it may be a little bit too early to judge. Um, and I suspect there'll be more support measures from, from the authorities in China, more credit uh, to support the economy. Um, but so far, it's been disappointing. Uh, the data around drawdowns, what does that tell us about the recoveries across APAC in 2002 and 2008? And what does this data tell us about what to expect now? You know, one of the really interesting aspects of Asia is you know, on a relative basis, on a relative price to book basis, Asia is now trading back at the same discount it was during the 97, 98 crisis. Now that was clearly a fairly extreme episode in history. So it's really, really interesting from a, from a relative valuation point of view. Um, over the period since 1990, there's been about four, there's been more than four, but four major drawdowns of around 50%. Um, historically, from those levels, um, the equity markets have rallied more than 100%. So there's significant upside, uh, potentially, uh, over the next few years in Asia Pacific. So there's a, we see we're actually perversely very bullish uh, in, in that respect in terms of the opportunity. That's great news for the region here. Well, with your investment strategist hat on, where is the smart money right now? Well, I should say that where are we investing? Uh, we've got a, a couple of areas. Number one, we've, we've, we, we, we are long some Asian high yield credit. Um, again, I mentioned the distress, the, the spreads were around a thousand basis points, quite attractive, decent carry. Uh, we've got a, an allocation into a banks in Asia Pacific. Uh, our, our portfolio has a quality bias there. The dividend yield is six percent on that basket. Twelve percent trend return on equity, um, and much better balance sheets compared to the U.S. In fact, that that sub portfolios outperform U.S. banks by over twenty percent year to date, uh, which is fairly significant. And then the third area on the long side is that we've just got a quality bias. Of, sorry, a quality portfolio of equities in, in the region. Um, the final one on the short side is that we're short consumer discretionary stocks in my home country, Australia. Hmm. Uh, consumer spending still not quite there yet. So perhaps what's worth exploring is your view on how a hard landing in the US economy could impact the US dollar. Yeah, perversely, th there's, a, there's a concept with, with the US dollar that it actually performs well when the US economy is outperforming but it also performs well, paradoxically, um, going into a hard landing because the, the US um, is still a safe haven currency. And so when people are uh, redeeming or repatriating assets back into US dollars, the, the safe haven flows. And also still around 40 to 50% of all the liabilities in the world are still denominated in dollars. Okay, now there is an inverse correlation between Asian equities and the US dollar. What is this next chart telling us about this relationship right now? Well, I think the good news is that the dollar's corrected since October last year. So there has been some easing in the dollar and that's helped broader financial conditions improve. Obviously that's partly related to the hope that inflation's peaked and interest rates have peaked in the US. And there'll be a shift in relative interest rate differentials. Um, the, we fear though, that, that if there is another phase of US dollar strength, either because the Fed's not finished and they have to hike rates much further, take the terminal rate to say five and a half or 6%, that that would be a challenge um, for, for assets that, that are the inverse of the US dollar. And finally, if there is a recession, how would you reallocate? Well, we see it as, a, as an opportunity. So 
The good news, as I said, in, in Asia Pacific is that valuations are at distress levels, both in outright and relative terms. Um, so if we did see another drawdown in phase e later this year, we would definitely see that as an opportunity to scale into uh, equities in this part of the world and, and assets in this part of the world more broadly. Thank you for your insights, Nick. That was Nick Ferris, Chief Investment Officer at Vantage Point. And thank you to our resident expert, Alex Holmes from Oxford Economics. Thank you both. The U.S. could be on a collision course for an economic recession, though despite mounting evidence, the world is on the sidelines waiting for the other shoe to drop. Will it come crashing down with a thud or glide in for a soft landing? Only time will tell. Thanks for tuning in to episode four of ICR Your Trade. ICR Your Trade is brought to you by IC Markets, a leading high-performance trading provider. Trade out to IC Markets. Thanks for joining us today, and we'll see you next time.